All right, so our first presentation is by Jason Hooten. He's a fourth year medical student from the University of Washington. He graduated from high school in Kansas City, and he went to BYU, Idaho. And he's going to be presenting Tarion's Marginal Degeneration Case Presentation and Discussion. Good morning. Uh, like I said, my name is Jason Hooten. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Washington. And today I'll be talking about a case of marginal degeneration that I've been working on under the direction of Dr. Moshefar and Dr. Edmonds for about the last week and a half. Um, it's an interesting case, I believe. It's got good pathology, but it's also been fun since the patient is actually from, uh, from Iran and uh, lives there in Iran, so I've been corresponding with some doctors there. Uh, the language has been a bit of a barrier, to say the least, and I appreciate their patience, but um, it's, been, it's been pretty fun, and I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. So let's start off and look at the patient. Um, I guess this doesn't come forward. We have a 16-year-old female uh, who comes in with complaint of decreasing vision in her left eye over the last month. Uh, she denies any pain, uh, photophobia, itching, or tearing. Her history is notable for uh, a case of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, that she's had since the age of five years old and uh, has these symptoms that, that go along with that. We look at her, she comes in the door. Um, it's obvious she has a little bit of a sensory exotropia and then some significant edema in that left eye. Continuing with the history, she has had a couple of episodes of this in the past, um, not near as significant as this case, she says, um, and, and they were basically resolved with um, some sodium chloride, 5% ointment, and some drops. They resolve spontaneously, but again, this is, this is much more significant this time. Uh, she has no history of eye, inf eye infections or contact lens use, and like I said, has the history of arthritis. Social history, uh, she works as a carpet weaver, which is obviously complicated by the arthritis. Uh, she lives in a small city quite a ways away from the, the, the clinic, which makes follow-up difficult. She has been started on methotrexate uh, weekly and prednisone daily, which has given her some um, relief of symptoms, but as you can see in this picture, her disease is, has already started to cause destruction of her joints. Um, in that third digit of her left hand, she already has a bit of a swan neck deformity, and I've actually seen more recent pictures um, that show that it's, it's progressed even past that. So the exam, um, when she presents, her, her vision is 20 over 40 in her right eye, uh, counting fingers at 10 centimeters in her <coughs> left eye. Uh, best corrective visual acuity shows no improvement. Uh, the right pupil does seem to respond to light. Um, but the left pupil isn't well visualized due to the edema, and it's obviously difficult to check for a relative a after a pupillary defect. Um, extraocular motility is full except for that um, sensory exotropia, and then everything else is basically unremarkable. So let's look at the eye. This is the right eye. Uh, we can see here some injunction of the conjunctiva. Uh, the real pathology, though, is, is here in the, the cornea. Uh, we can see circumferential, peripheral, uh, thinning of the cornea with some opacification. There's lipid deposition, especially at the leading edge. And it's hard to tell here, but there is a little bit of neovascularization, I think, is also occurring. Um, <coughs> it's also hard to tell from these photographs, but the, the phys physicians describe that there is thinning of the cornea, vesting on slit lamp, um, and some also some fr circumferential bulging or ectasia is what they also describe. The other thing here that's kind of hard to see, but if we look closely, is that in this uh, inferior nasal uh, region of the cornea, there is some cloudiness, uh, some edema, and that correlates well when we look at these next couple pictures. This isn't the greatest photograph, but there is what, what appears to be in the posterior aspect of the cornea, uh, a detachment of decimase membrane. And if we look at the OTC, it's, it correlates again well with what we saw earlier. There is a, uh, what appears to be a, a cyst or a, what we're calling a partial detachment of decimase membrane that coincides exactly with where we saw that edema earlier. And um, if you also look at this picture, there's there's um, some thinning occurring here in the periphery, and then some other maybe edema or cystic type changes as well. Here's an orb scan looking at the corneal thickness, and again, it's really obvious what we're looking at here with this significant thickness in this region where we saw that, that cloudiness, and then it's basically it's thickness throughout the entire cornea. Um, if we look at the keratometry, I wouldn't put a whole lot of weight in this just because the edema is probably uh, giving us some, some weird results. Uh, we see thinning of the vertical axis 
um, which it really isn't typical for, for Terrians, uh, so it's hard to, to see really how much weight we should put in this, this image. Moving on to the left eye, very similar to the right in the presentation, except for the fact that we also have uh, the significant edema, uh, which is what's causing her the problems with her vision. Again, the, the opacification, the lipid, de lipid deposition circumferentially around the entire eye, um, it's pretty stereotypical for, for Terrians. And again, it, co it coincides really well with what we see on OTC or OCT. Uh, this is in the superior aspect of the cornea, but if we followed it through, if we had time to look at all the different slices, it pretty much follows through most of the eye. Uh, we're calling this a complete detachment. And, um, and again, there's a little bit of thinning in the periphery. The corneal scan, again, probably not a whole lot of significance here. It does, the, the center and the rest of the eye does, does appear to be thicker than normal. Um, but, and we do see a little bit of thinning there in the periphery, but I also wanted to show you a bit of, a little bit better picture. This is from a pentacan, and this does a better job of illustrating this thinning that's occurring in the edges. We can see these areas of, of yellow and red that, that really shouldn't be there and, and demonstrate good pathology for this corneal thinning disease. And again, the keratometry, uh, this is actually a lot more typical for what we would expect in a, a Tarian's patient. Vertical, uh, vertical, uh, Increased, increased, excuse me, increased steepness in the vertical axis, causing significant amounts of astigmatism, um, which causes the, the normal change in vision for these patients. So the diagnosis, we already, already talked about this, it's Terrian's marginal degeneration. Uh, this is a disease that uh, has been around since it was, it was first diagnosed by Terrian back in the year 1900, so it's been around for a while. Uh, I, I tried to look up some information about this Terrian individual, but I Googled it and really couldn't find anything. So after wasting probably more time than I should have, I decided to move on. Uh, this is a little bit better example of the, this, the, what you see in slit lamp with the thinning. There's a bit of a step off here that, that is even more pronounced than some other, uh, other pictures. Oops. So the etiology, this is a rare disease. Um, <coughs> there aren't that many case reports actually about it out there. Um, there's, a, there's a predilection for males, three to one. Uh, it's onset, depending on where you look in the literature, is 20s to 30s, but I guess by definition it's over 40. Uh, it, by definition as well, does not have any systemic associations, which is what makes this, this case kind of interesting. Signs, um, it, the disease usually starts out with uh, some opacification, uh, some small dots in the, an, in the anterior portion of the stroma in the superior aspect of the eye. As it progresses, a thin panis will form and kind of coalesce and start moving circumferentially. Uh, there's thinning that's obviously occurring, which is a significant part of the disease. It's usually a pretty slow process, taking years, which again, why this, which is again why this patient is, is kind of an interesting example. Um, as the disease progresses, we see again astigmatism, a regular astigmatism occurring, causes a decrease in vision, and then in extreme cases, uh, we actually see perforation. The patients are usually pretty asymptomatic. Uh, they don't usually have any complaints until the disease has progressed to the point that there is the astigmatism. At that point, it's usually just a bit of supportive care. Um, rigid contact lenses usually do a pretty good job of correcting the astigmatism. In more complicated cases, uh, piggyback lenses work well. Uh, the thing to consider with these patients is that because of the thinning, they are at increased risk of, of perforation if there is some sort of trauma, so we do encourage eye protection. And then finally, if the disease is, again, in its most advanced stages and it's looking like it's actually going to have a perforation of the cornea, then uh, there have been examples of people performing a lamellar uh, penetrating keratoplasty as a, as a more extreme measure. So this, what I've been talking about, is basically what we call the, the traditional uh, Tarians. There has been a variant, an inflammatory variant, that was described by Austin and Brown back in the 1980s, and there has been more and more case reports uh, correlating with what, what they found. Uh, these patients are usually younger in age. Uh, they have recurrent episodes of episcleritis and scleritis. Remember, technically, Tarians is a non-inflammatory disease, but we, we see that in these, we see it difference in these examples. Uh, these patients also usually have faster progression, which correlates well with what we saw today. And then because it's an inflammatory process, topical steroids do, pr do provide, excuse me, some relief. So what were the significant features of this case? First, um, it was showed bilateral complete circumferential thinning. It's usually not that advanced and usually doesn't uh, manifest itself in such a complete manner. Uh, the second thing uh, is that uh, there's actually no reported cases in the literature of a decimase detachment occurring with Tarians. And there is several, there are several examples in the literature of, of 
breaks in the undecimase membrane and maybe a little bit of cystic changes and cyst forming, um, but, but nothing to this extent. And so what we believe is that maybe this is just demonstrating the spectrum. It maybe starts out <coughs> as some thinning in the membrane, maybe some breaks, progresses to a cyst, and then finally at the, the extreme edges we see uh, the actual detachment. Uh, and then finally the association with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, again, by definition, the disease is um, not associated with any systemic conditions. There are two examples in the literature of uh, being associated with rheumatoid arthritis, but none with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And we think this is important because even though technically it's non a non-inflammatory disease, even in these non-inflammatory variants they've shown in the last um, few years, they've shown that there is signs of inflammation at a subclinical level. So we think that this might uh, be what's kind of driving the progression of the disease, and maybe the reason that this patient manifested so early and so rapidly is because the juvenile idiopathic arthritis was really exacerbating uh, the condition. To conclude, I just did want to give some a few clinical pearls in terms of differentiating uh, this disease from some other uh, similar diseases. A couple, a few buzzwords here. Peripheral ul ulcerative ker keratitis is usually associated with um, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, although it can be found with infectious causes and trauma. Um, the big difference here is the epithelial defect. We don't see an epithelial defect in Perrin's marginal degeneration. We do see it with the peripheral ul ulcerative ker keratitis. If we look at mo more, uh, excuse me, Morin's ulcer, this is also, um, I guess some people would say it's even, even a type of per PUK. Um, this is different first because there's usually significant pain. Um, and then be, uh, in addition to the epithelial defect, there's also, um, even though it actually does show some peripheral gutter, uh, on clinical exam there's actually a, an overhanging edge with Morin's ulcer, which really, I guess, differentiates it, differentiates it pretty easily uh, from Terrian's. Finally, furrow degeneration is a really a benign condition compared to Terrian's. It's asymptomatic and doesn't have the, the vascularization or the ectasia. Keratoconus and pellucid marginal degeneration are both similar diseases but can be easily differentiated because of a lack of a, a gutter. And the ectasia in these examples is usually in the center or in the inferior margin uh, of the cornea. So I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Moshefar and Dr. Edmonds for their help throughout this last week and a half, and then also uh, Dr. Vijdani for his um, never-ending patience as we emailed back and forth and tried to get the specifics of the case. There's my references. Any questions? And there was no systemic disease at all, it was just the... It was interesting, this patient still seemed to progress even being on methotrexate, which I thought would hopefully slow it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, topical steroids wouldn't, wouldn't be an ideal long-term solution. It's interesting though, because <coughs> now that we're getting better and better understanding of inflammation, uh, we often think of something like methotrexate would be the, like a, you know, slowing the heart or the tumor. But, but there can come something that's a little more specific depending upon the process that it has a little bit better effect. You know, uh, so uh, it, it's been hard to know, but I, I have a feeling we're going to find out all of the same in the in terms of this having a different inflammation. And if we can understand that a little better, the more common disease, we probably will be safe. Right.
Right, right. And nobody sees the rest. It's pretty rare. I just had this one. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I failed to mention they did do an intercamera this projection. This is a curtain. This is a curtain. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty <laughs> incredible curtain you've got. Uh, you know, so what is, what is the They did do an intercamera injection of air. Um, it worked for a little while, and then she started having this thing kick in. So. Uh, these, these cases, I mean, I, I assume they made a different point where uh, the, the regular civil business stuff, you've got to do a clearance claim. And uh, this was a regular civil service jury trial. Most part, I talked about that maybe because there's a thing in the periphery of thin screening from sort of force that's kind of tossing it down. There's got to be some depth and force going on. Yeah. Why, why that sort of fell off? Yeah. Um, maybe there's a hole out in the per periphery. There are. I've seen some screenings where uh, I remember one I had that there was a, a perforator that you produced a squib that looked like a filter in blood, a huge filter in blood, and uh, the blood made all sorts of chemical changes to the skin. Oh. All right, so our next presentation is by Chad Jackson. He's a fourth year student at the University of Kentucky. He grew up here in Salt Lake, made the unfortunate decision to go to the school down south. <laughs> and as well as our next presenter, actually, this is like all BYU grand rounds. This is a great week for that. <laughs> um, so he's going to be presenting Birdshot or Not. 